Bueno, buenas noches, good evening. Uh, my name is Barbara Fernandez. It is a great honor for me to be the chair of the Latino Endowment Fund of the Hartford Foundation. And I welcome you to this magnificent evening of fun and a very interesting uh, initiative that we're launching and just a time to be with friends again in person, which is wonderful. Before um, I go on, I want to thank from my heart three amazing legislators that are here that have always stood up for the Latino community, the great fighters that we are so proud to have in this room. These are people that I have known for many years, and when it comes to fighting for, the, for justice, fighting for equality, fighting so the Latinos can, can in fact have a good life, we have three people here that we can all be proud that they represent us. I want to introduce to you Edwin Vargas. <laughs> Mi amiga Hilda Santiago. <laughs> y la número uno luchadora, <laughs> Mini Gonzalez. <laughs> I ask all of you to please put your telephone on vibrate if uh, you haven't done so. Um, at your table, you will see the um, agenda for today so that you can follow along with us. Um, and obviously, I want to ask you to please join the Latino Endowment Fund of the Hartford Foundation. If you're not a member, it is easy, we've got a QR cord here, please uh, join us, join our magnificent group of people, and if you're already a member, muchisimas gracias. And so without further words, I want to introduce to you a friend and a champion of the Latino community in Hartford. I know this man from the time that he was in uh, Washington, D.C., and uh, needless to say, that spark, that drive, that commitment to the community I saw in Washington, and we are so lucky in Hartford that he has decided to bring that spark here. My amazing colleague, friend, Jay Williams. <laughs> Thank you very much for the gracious introduction. Good evening. It is so wonderful to be here this evening. Uh, and this evening really is the manifestation, the visual manifestation of uh, longstanding partnerships that exist between so many key stakeholders in this community, but particularly uh, the relationship uh, that we have with the Latino Endowment Fund, which is longstanding and, and certainly uh, started prior to my arrival, but also excited to uh, see the relationship that we have with the Hispanic Federation uh, and Ingrid Alvarez and the team there to uh, facilitate the conversation uh, that is going to occur this evening. As you are aware, it has been the past uh, three to four years that the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving has really uh, sharpened its focus in our activities in this community. We are nearly 97 years old. And uh, about four years ago, we embarked upon a series of conversations and listening sessions with the communities that we represent, with our donors, with our partners, with our stakeholders, and we also did a deep dive into data that speaks to the quality of life uh, in our region. And what we discovered will not be a surprise to any of you in this room, that this is a wonderful community uh, with significant resources and wonderful assets, uh, but the opportunities in this community are not equitable. They are not equally accessed by specific parts of our community and specifically our communities of color. And the Latino community stands out for the richness and the creativity and the intellect and the talent, but also we see and the data demonstrates the barriers that exist. And you all, and we know that from lived experience. What is still amazing to me that in 2022, there are still those who question 
whether those barriers exist. There are still those who question whether or not there are still inequities and structural barriers that do not allow for the talent uh, and the, all of the, the, the richness to be applied and lived through our communities. So that's why it is so critical uh, that we have events like this that will speak to the data, that will ground for others what you all and we know every day from life and living. From the time that we get up in the morning and go through our work routine or a social routine or navigate society, things and barriers that might be invisible to others are things that we have to navigate just, you almost become reflexive. You just know that this is something that you have to deal with as being a part of the community. So it is unfortunate, but what is inspiring is that there is the persistence and dedication of everyone in this room and so many others who are not here but who are represented here in spirit to continue to allow our efforts to be driven and undergird by the data, to continue to put our talents and our minds together, uh, to continue to represent the fact that this community cannot thrive. If the Latino community uh, doesn't have the opportunities to access, if the other communities of color don't come together in ways that really demonstrate how critical it is, how critical it is that we have everyone live to their fullest potential that the talent, the intellect, the creativity, all the things that come with the lived experience of the Latino community are woven into this fabric of this community in ways that this should just be second nature. So uh, it's the work of the foundation. We know that we just have uh, uh, one part. There are so many partners out there and partnerships like this uh, are inspiring and exciting. And the fact that we will have a discussion with a panelist of people who have not only lived experience, but their professional experience, they've dedicated their lives and their talents to moving this forward. So thank you all for everything uh, that you have done in this community, that you are doing now, and that you will continue to do. And please know that the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving uh, is here and invested in this for the long run. This isn't just sort of the, the flavor du jour that we're gonna move on to the next thing. Uh, but this is who we are, this is why we exist, and we cannot do it without you. Thank you all very much. Look forward to the rest of the evening. Come on up, Barbara. Yes. OK, let me adjust this, because I am not quite as tall as Jay is. <clears throat> In fact, I was laughing when I saw Barbara, because poor besita. La cabecita no dama, you know? But anyway. Thank you, Jay and Barbara, for your welcoming and opening remarks of today, for today's program. And thank you to our fabulous musicians, Lorena Garay and her colleagues. Uh, that, that music has been playing since we arrived, and I don't know about you, but it definitely put me in a festive mood. Yes. Um, today, my colleague, Aura Alvarado, Director of Communications and Community Relations for the Capital Region Education Council, and I will be moderating the program. I am Rosaida Morales Rosario. For those of you who don't know me, which I don't think many of you don't know me, but I am the president of Rosario and Associates, and I'm one of the founders of the Latino Endowment Fund. And the Latino Endowment Fund is a fund that was created by Latinos for Latinos. It affords us the opportunity to have collective impact through a giving circle giving us the ability to strengthen and enhance the community even more than we do in our everyday lives. It also models for others the importance of working together to achieve a common good. And finally, not only do we educate ourselves by learning more about Hispanic community needs, but it also helps those that are not Hispanic understand what the critical issues are facing our community today. And since COVID, there are many issues, as many of you are well aware of. We wanted to take this opportunity to just share with you why we commissioned the research project on the status of the Latino community. Some of you may be thinking, haven't we been researched enough, right? I don't know about you, but yeah, there has been a lot of research going on. But despite the fact that there is an abundance of data out there about Latinos, it is usually gathered analyzed and interpreted by non-Latinos. Very few Latinos are engaged in these pursuits. And our community voices are rarely centered in these conversations. As grant makers at the Latino Endowment Fund, 
We believe that the most effective grant making strategy weaves together approaches that ensures that authentic community voices provide context for the data and that the data captures the lived experiences of community members, of our community members. Additionally, we also want to advance the knowledge of the public and specifically policymakers, yay policymakers, including uh, federal, state, and local elected officials and those who work for the governments. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, as well as community nonprofits along with other service agencies regarding the quality of life issues in the greater Hartford area. So today, we are kicking off this research project with our great partners at the Hispanic Federation. I'm now going to turn it over to my colleague, Aura Alvarado, to introduce our presenters for this evening. Thank you. Buenas noches. Uh, before I introduce our, um, the next portion, I did want to pay, if you can take your attention to my right, right? Arte Popular is here. Those beautiful centerpieces you see were created by them. These are a group of women that we sponsored to the, through the Latino Endowment Fund grant. And I'm just gonna read a little bit about them to you. Arte Popular is a collective of immigrant female artisans providing resources and networking opportunities to showcase artistic talent and culture, supporting its members, livelihood, and well-being. Their work has the primary intention of fostering cultural work in the immigrant community of Hartford, Connecticut, and the creation of, the alterna of alternative economic models that can benefit us collectively, while breaking down barriers that have historically kept us from um, training and funding opportunities available in this country. Arte Popular is the branch that sustains the faith of the American dream in the minds and hearts of the immigrant female artisans. What better way to celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month? Thank you, ladies. So if you're interested, the centerpieces are for sale. They will accept Venmo and cash, and maybe your check too, I'm not sure, <laughs> depending who you are. But please, um, and they're selling some of their jewelry, so thank you. And now, they've got great desserts. Oh my God, yes, the carrot cake. <laughs> I'm a carrot cake girl. All right. So I just want to welcome everyone. I want to congratulate the Latino Endowment Fund, my colleagues. Uh, this was a long um, haul, and we're here. So congratulations to us. Yes. I want to thank uh, the Hoffer Foundation staff for helping us put this together. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Ingrid Alvarez, a very dear friend. Ingrid is the Vice President for Policy and Strategic Engagement at the Hispanic Federation the nation's premier Latino nonprofit membership organization. In her professional role, her portfolio includes leading the organization's public policy priorities and advocacy strategies across the Hartford Federation's state and regional offices. Ms. Alvarez has been a member of Hispanic Federation's team since 2013 and has previously served as the New England Regional Director, spearheading the institution's nonprofit capacity building grant making, technical assistance, public policy and advocacy work in Connecticut, Rhode Island and Massachusetts. And I just wanna say, I don't know Ingrid, if you remember when you were first hired at the Harf at, at Hispanic Federation, you were quoted by the Times, the News Times, you were saying this is a very unique opportunity. With the resources available to the Federation, we could do some incredible things at the state level. You remember saying that when you were hired? Well, let me tell you, girl, it, you have proven to, that to be true as she continues her commitment to the Latino community, not here, just in, not here only in the greater Hartford, Connecticut, but nationally. Ingrid, thank you for doing this for us. And then she's joined by her counterpart, Diana Caba. Diana Caba is, an assistant, is Assistant Vice President of Policy and Community Engagement at Hispanic Federation the nation's premier Latino nonprofit membership, as I mentioned. Diana implements advocacy, strategy, development, and driving Hispanic Federation's issue, campaign, and activities. She previously served as Senior Director of Economic Empowerment, leading the agency's programmatic and advocacy efforts that seek to increase the financial security of Latino families. Diana, welcome, and I'm so glad to get to know you today.
Um, it is uh, truly uh, an honor and a, and a privilege um, to present to you this evening. Um, right now, um, Diane and I are going to tag team. Um, we're sort of kitty cornered to the screen, right? So she's going to click for me, <laughs> um, and then I'll click for her. And so very quickly, I want to talk a little bit about this study commissioned by the Latino Endowment Fund um, at the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving. Um, this study will provide a comprehensive st statistical portrait of the greater Hartford region's Latino community using some of the best and most recent data um, from a wide variety of sources. The study will examine targeted quality of life outcome areas such as economic vitality, education, opportunity, career readiness, and workforce development, health equity, and all centered on key equity indicators. Cover, if we can do the equity indicator slide, I would appreciate that. Okay, um, <laughs> oh, thank you. The impact study aims to offer a thorough so systematic overview of key data analysis of trends, and an unprecedented look at Latino Greater Hartford in comparative and recent historical perspective. Right? Um, so this is the slide um, around every um, equity indicator that we seek to base and center uh, the study on. That's okay. We're gonna go to the demographic trends in the state. Mm -hmm. It's okay. Um, and I'm gonna move this here so that I can make room for this one. So just some broad brush, right? Um, data and information to center our conversation and dialogue this evening. And you know, uh, starting with what demographic trends and shifts um, for us in the state looks like. Um, Connecticut's population in 2022 is estimated to be at 3.61 million. Um, as a state, we rank 20 as the 29th populous state. Latinos in the state account for 637,112, albeit with a very incomplete census count uh, in 2020. The median age of a Latino is 29.3 years. I remember, so Ara went way back for me when she introduced me. When I started this work, it was 27 years old. And so now we're at 29.3 years. In 2021, the largest racial and ethnic group in the state um, is and continues to be white, non-Hispanic, um, with a population of 2.3 million. Um, but between 2010 and 2021, Latinos and the Latino population in the state Grew, uh, had the most growth. Um, it grew by 154,711 Latinos um, from a mere 482,401 in 2010 to 637,112 in 2021. The number of Latino residents um, uh, having, has grown or have, having grown by approximately 30% over the last decade. The state's Hispanic population um, uh, increased 144 to 106. Um, and the one salient um, point here is that all of this growth in our state um, has happened in what we call urban centers. And so Hartford, New Haven, Bridgeport. Um, when in fact, Connecticut's population peaked in 2013. And so for every white Caucasian resident across the state that we lose, we replace with our Tito population. So yet uh, in 2010 and in 2021, the share of the population um, that is known as Hispanic or Latino um, grew the most, increasing from 4.2 percentage points in 2010 to 17.7 percentage points. And driving that growth, um, or Latino children in particular, who were the biggest contributors to the growth in diversity in the last 10 years in our state, followed by Asian American children, 
a population that grew by 12%. And then the population of multiracial children climbed 74%, while the number of black children decreased by 8%. And we're gonna get into um, a little bit about what we mean by multiracial children, because that also is Latino. So race and ethnicity trend. Yes. Gracias, Carla. Um, so it's a little hard um, from my angle, but I have my laptop here. So what we're looking at now is a really dense, wonky slide. Um, to the left, you have all of um, the uh, race and ethnicity category, um, colored coded, mixed, other Native American, Asian and Pacific Islander, um, immigrant versus Asian and Pacific Islander US born. Um, Latino immigrant, Latino U.S. born, black immigrant, black U.S. born, white immigrant, and white U.S. born. Um, and the salient point in this slide is that it's in particular for the greater Hartford region between 1980 and as we project to 2050, the blue block is Latino and it has consistently and steadily grown across each of the decades, and it will continue to do so, right? Latinos um, include uh, people of Hispanic origin of any race and all other groups. Race and ethnicity in the greater Hartford region. Um, this slide, again, for the uh, Greater Hartford region for year 2020, um, depicts uh, the growth um, and the total population under each of the race and ethnicity categories. Uh, Latino at 188,800. Uh, the white uh, Caucasian population continues to be the largest still in the state um, in every region. Um, and um, I'm gonna just go to the next slide really quickly. And so when we talk about Latinos in the greater Harford region, right, um, this slide depicts um, race, ethnicity, and age um, as of 2019. Uh, and so uh, we have 31% are Latinos that are less than 18 years of age, 13% or Latinos 18 to 24, 16%, that's 16, right, Carla? Thank you, it's a little tiny here. I don't have my reading glasses. 16% um, are ages 25 to 34, 14% 35 to 44, 11% 45 to 54, 8% 55 to 64, and 7% 65 and older. Um, and this is critical, right? We are relatively very, very young. Um, and that has implications across workforce, education, um, conversations, policy, um, around investments. Um, so, based on the data from the State Department of Labor and, and Economic and Community Development, they project the Latino growth at 1.7%. I'm sorry, they project, the population growth is projected to grow 1.7% in the 25 years between 2015 and, 20, and 2040. In contrast, right, uh, growth of the Latino population is expected to account for 64% of the total growth in Connecticut over a 10 year period from 2015 to 2025. Again, um, the, the correlation, right, between the median age of a Latino, um, our ability to learn, to work, to contribute, to innovate, right? And this state's economic recovery um, uh, are intrinsically tied. So who lives in the region um, and how are the demographics changing? So this slide um, is just another depiction, right, between 2010 and 2050 
the gray bars is for every decade on the left hand side, you have by how much the white Caucasian population has decreased. On the right hand side, the orange bars is by how much num numerically um, Latinos have replaced um, plus the decrease in population um, for uh, Caucasians in the state. Which brings us to talk a little bit about the racial generation gap, right? And what it means for the region. And so, <clears throat> this slide is the percent of people of color by age in the greater Hartford region between 1980 and 2019. The purple line is the percent of seniors who are people of color. And the teal blue depicts the percent of youth who are people of color. And so why, why does this matter? In 1980, there was a racial generation gap. The age between, or the age gap between youth and seniors of color of 14% compared to 29% in 2019, bridging the racial generation gap between diverse youth of color and a predominantly white senior population in the greater Hartford region is critical to building a strong workforce ready for jobs of the future. And since the research suggests high racial generation gap results in lower investments in education. So how does the greater Hartford region's um, economic equity indicators um, compare, right? So what you're looking at here thank you, um, is the hourly wage for a Latino, an African American, and a white person in the greater Hartford region. Um, and we've gotten it down to the numeric number as well. So for Latinos, it's $19 an hour, and there's an estimated 43,951 Latino workers at that hourly wage followed by the African-American community at an average of $21 an hour at 36,881 workers in the region. And the white population at an average of $30 an hour um, and uh, approximately at 250,425 workers. Economic vitality measures how the greater Hartford region is faring on measures of growth and well-being that make the region prime for business, jobs, and economic growth. A better business climate means a brighter future for all people in the region. In an, inequi in an equitable economy, all workers would earn a living wage without systematic differences by race and gender. So can workers earn a living wage? This slide is the median hourly wage by race, ethnicity, and gender for the greater Hartford region as of 2019. And so when we disaggregate data, right, we also know that while a Latino male earns an average of $19 an hour in the region, a Latina female is only earning $17 an hour. The Greater Hartford region in 2019, Latino workers had the lowest median wage, followed by, uh, I'm sorry, the lowest median wage at 19 um, per hour, and the Asian or Pacific Islander workers, um, approximately 19,796 workers in the region, had the highest median wage at $34 an hour. In 2019, among all full time workers, the median wage um, was highest for Asian or Pacific Islanders, male workers at $36 an hour, and the lowest for Latina females at $17 per hour. So can full-time jobs lift people out of poverty? This slide is the percent of working poor by race and ethnicity in the greater Hartford region. At, poverty, uh, at the poverty level below 200%, for all workers in 2019. 
And so in 2019, among all workers in all racial and ethnic groups, 13% of Latino workers were working full time and living below 200% of the poverty level compared to 3% of white workers in the region. Therefore, can all residents access employment? Um, and this slide in particular is the unemployment rate by race, ethnicity in the greater Hartford region as of year 2019. And so the greater Hartford region in 2019, the Asian and Pacific Islander population had the lowest unemployment rate at 3%. And the mixed other population, and remember, Latinos are also mixed and other, um, had the highest unemployment rate and 9%. So I'm gonna switch with my fabulous colleague, Diana Cava, who will take us through the rest of the slide deck and I will click for you. Huh? You have to go first. Okay. <laughs> I, I learned on the job right now, you know, <laughs> which way to click. Hi everyone, thank you so much for, for letting me uh, infiltrate. I, came, I come from New York, so. <laughs> but I uh, have the pleasure of working with our, our, my colleagues here in Connecticut and um, having been able to help put together the presentation and um, assemble a lot of this information. Whoop, whoop, go up now. <laughs> there you go. So picking up on what Ingrid just shared about um, can all residents access un un employment? Here we have a graph too that shows um, between, in the greater Hartford region between 1980 and 2019, the average unemployment rate for people of color changed from six to seven percent. And as you can see there, <laughs> and as you can see, um, in 2010 it actually um, peaked at 11 percent. Yeah. Yes. And with regard to earned income growth for full-time workers, uh, between 1980 and 2019, again, in the greater Hartford region, um, earned income growth for full-time wage and salary workers, those that were in the 10th percentile um, actually lost um, income at negative uh, 1%. And as you can see, so on and so forth, you know, the, the greater the percentile, um, the, the more earned growth um, with regards to income. But the question here is, is economic growth broadly shared? Uh, as we can see here with this graph, um, uh, the latest information from 2019, uh, household income between the 95th and the 20th percentile, 95% of all households make 260,000, two, sorry, 260,300 or less compared to 20% of all households that make 29,200 or less. Inequality undermines economic opportunity and prosperity. Inequality does not only harm those at the bottom of the income spectrum, it is bad for everyone. Studies that uh, find that income inequality depresses economic gro growth by limiting educational opportunities for low-income children, decreasing individual income, thus reducing spending, harming health and well-being, and spurring excessive debt. On the other hand, greater economic inclusion leads to more robust and sustained growth. And continuing the, 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 the question, is economic growth broadly shared? Um, is ec economic growth creating jobs? Between 1990 and 2020, job growth was highest in middle wage industries and earnings growth was highest in high wage industries in the region. Strong growth in middle wage jobs and rising wages for low wage workers are hallmarks of inclusive growth. As we all know here, job growth is critical for economic vitality, but it is important to, show, to grow good jobs that pay family supporting wages and offer opportunities for upward mobility. The trend over recent decades has been job polarization with much faster growth in low and high wage jobs than in the middle wage jobs that have typically provided opportunities for workers without college degrees to be financially secure and enter the middle class. And although low wage jobs have grown quickly, Wages have, been, have largely been stagnant. And here we share um, just a bit of information um, that has also informed some of our work with regards to digital skilling and digital workforce development, which I'm happy to talk about in another time. Um, but we, you know, as you see here, more than half of Latino workers need digital skills. This is across the United States, but 
you know, pretty sure that that also is the case here in Connecticut. Um, as I just mentioned before, you know, with regards to lower, low paying jobs with stagnant wages, uh, our community finds ourselves in mostly those low paying jobs. As we saw with the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, for, for the most part, those who were hardest hit were those in, in, in those lower paying jobs. Latinos are mostly, you know, are working in these types of jobs in the service industry, uh, in farming, um, what have you. Um, so, you know, this is something that you know, we're working on, side note, uh, at, the, at the Hispanic Federation to address this, the need for training, uh, especially to address those who are not able to obtain, you know, certain certifications, degrees, and what have you to close this gap. So how much larger would the economy be with racial equity? So as you can see here, I know the numbers are, are, are pretty small here, but um, if there were no racial gaps, in income, the Hartford, the Greater Hartford Region um, GDP, so the gross domestic product, would have been about 14 billion dollars larger in 2019. So that that's that's significant, right? Uh, eliminating racial inequities in income would strengthen families, communities, and local economies. Wage and employment gaps by race as well as gender are not only bad for people of color; they hold back the entire economy. Rising wages and incomes, particularly for low income people, households, lead to more consumer spending, which is a key driver of economic growth and job creation. And so we're, you know, just to leave you with that image on the potential, right, that, that we have that is not, you know, obviously we're, we're focusing on the Latino community and we're focusing on those hardest hit, but really at the end of the day, it's a, it's, it affects us all, right? You know, if, we, if one does well, we all, you know, we all have to do well, right, to make sure that we're, we're, we're in a good place. But just to focus a little bit on education opportunity, um, to share here with you, um, in 2019, 25% of Latinos in the region hold less than a high school diploma. 6% of Latinos hold an associate's degree only, and 17% of Latinos hold a bachelor's degree or higher in 2019. Uh, with regards to the state's K through 12 enrollment, there are 513,615 uh, total students, of which 148,744 are Hispanic and Latino students. And in the last 10 years, Connecticut's English learner population has grown by nearly 13,000 students, while the state's total enrollment has decreased by nearly 51,000 students. Uh, more than half of Connecticut students are children of color, but only 10.1% 10 10 of Connecticut teachers are people of color. And the, here's just some more data on the K through 12 student enrollment that I just shared. And then lastly, just to share um, some information on how healthy is Connecticut, how do health equity gaps affect residents? As you can see here on, on the, the graph that um, those without health insurance, 17 and older, uh, Hispanics are at 16%. Non-Hispanic whites, 4%, and non-Hispanic blacks, 9%. 94.9% of the population of Connecticut has health coverage with 52.7% on employee plans, 17.7% on Medicaid, 12.5% on Medicare, 11.1% on non-group plans, and 0.963% on military or VA plans. In 2019, approximately 204 of 500,000 Connecticut residents were uninsured, or 5.9% of the state population. This is an increase compared to 2017, where the, per the percent of uninsured citizens in Connecticut was 5.48%. Thanks, Diana. I'll give Diana a breather, a breather there. Um, so impacts of housing. The housing burden, home ownership, and neighborhood poverty. Um, the slide that you're looking at right now is for the greater Hartford region. It is filtered and, and broken down by housing burden by tenures, um, severity, poverty as of 2019. Uh, all residents should have access to quality and affordable homes. Housing is the single largest expense for households, and far too many pay too much for housing. All of Connecticut State is housing burden, regardless of where you lie in that 95th percentile versus the 10th percentile. Every working individual and household in the state is housing burden. High housing costs squeeze family budgets, leaving very few resources to pay for other expenses, save for emergencies, or make long-term uh, investments. 
So how does home ownership, how, is housing affordable and then how does home ownership um, align or not with that? Um, this slide depicts for the greater Hartford region um, the severity of, house, of the housing burden as of 2019 across um, race and ethnicity. So home ownership is a critical pathway to economic security and mobility, helping lower income people build an asset and a long-term investment. And communities of color have faced major barriers to accessing sustainable home ownership, including having been negatively impacted by the foreclosure crisis, predatory lending, and contributing to the rising racial wealth gap. In 2019, Latino households had one of the lowest home ownership rates at 34%, and white households had the highest home ownership rate at 76%. I'll park that one there for a minute. So then, how does this intersect with neighborhood poverty? As of 2019, by race and ethnicity, um, you're looking at um, the percentage by race and ethnicity, I'm sorry, um, of individuals um, in high poverty neighborhoods. So in 2019, the white population had the lowest concentration of people living in high poverty neighborhoods at 2.1%, and the Latino population had the highest at 16.7%. I want to thank you for bearing with uh, our 30 slide deck. That's a lot, um, but it's critically important. And I mentioned a term, the disaggregation of data, and Rosaida um, was so gracious in how she opened up and the reason why data is collected. And who is, who is collecting data? Um, and what narrative does that data collection produce on our behalf? And so part of this remarkable opportunity to partner both with the Latino Endowment Fund and the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving to do this by us, for us, and also align it with the broader vision of the Hartford Foundation to conduct a well-being survey for the region as a whole allows us to draft, co-create that narrative together. And so our call to action this evening and our ask of each and every single one of you on your table, you have a postcard that looks like this. We ask you, give us feedback, join us. Um, this is only um, a slide deck and a piece of the work ahead. Um, we seek to engage um, our community in the greater Hartford region around focus groups, survey, focus groups and surveys. Um, and engage Latino residents in contributing and populating that data for themselves uh, so that then we could sit at the table with the Hartford Foundation and the Connecticut Data Collaborative and Data Haven and all the other uh, data think tanks, right, um, and center um, our own, um, our community's voice and their contribution um, and to truly commit to data disaggregation. Um, and not just for Latinos, but for every person of color in the region as well. So thank you for your time. Um, and at this juncture, I will pass it all. You want me to sit over there? I'm gonna go take a seat and I'm gonna give it back to Aura. Thank you. Thank you, that was amazing. So yes, we have um, Ingrid and Diana to sit for a little bit. So we're doing a little Q&A with them first before we introduce our panelists because we have a specific question for them based on the uh, presentation. So I wanna hear from all the smart people in the room. <laughs> it, that's all of us, right? Um, any questions specific for Ingrid and Diana? Rosita, if you can help me keep track of, if I'm missing any hands, please speak up. Flora in the back, yes, I knew you were gonna be interested in a lot of this data, my friend. <laughs> we have a mic coming. 
No, no, that's okay. And we can answer in English or in Spanish. So English or okay. Spanish. Si tienen preguntas en español o inglés para... Uh, I can do both. Yes. <laughs> so in your data, did you include um, undocumented? Uh, because we work with a lot of undocumented people and sometimes that $19 an hour is totally, the, totally what they're not making. Mm -hmm. And so, um, especially the women. So I want to thank you for that question. Um, yes. And so, um, you know, towards the tail end here, I, I, um, I shared, right? So, so this is just, we're just scratching the surface, right? Um, and while we're committed to, um, can we put on the racial equity indicators? To, to okay. the set of racial equity indicators the um, to center, um, it is important to encourage and to ensure that we're not monolith, right? And so as Latinos in the region, right, um, whether we're U.S. born, whether we're documented, whether we're U.S. citizen, whether, right, um, it all has um, impact on our lives and, and truly dictate our outcomes um, across the spectrum of equity indicators um, that we set. And so absolutely we seek um, to both um, work with, learn from, and incorporate the voices, right, of, of every spectrum of Latino in the greater Hartford region. And, and just to add to that, um, as you were mentioning at some points, uh, for this, it was to paint a general picture, but we already know, you know, when it comes to women, when it comes to undocumented, you know, certain, you know, disabled, what have you, um, you know, the, 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 the stats are gonna be that much more dire, but also really drives home the point where, that Ingrid made towards the end about data disaggregation and how data is collected and from who and how it's being used. Um, so we're hoping too with this project that with the surveys that, you know, we hope that you fill out and also share with your, your, your communities um, that we can capture more of those stories that are not being told so we can incorporate that for that final report. You know, I, I could geek out all night, but you know, um, Rosada gave me 20 minutes, right? And then, you know, you did so, really well. No, thank you. So you know, but yeah. So like, we can sift and slice and disaggregate, right? And and and, and success is defined um, for us in this in this impact study um, by how deep we go within our communities um, uh, to make it as inclusive as possible when we're sitting around focus groups, and we'll do them in person. We'll do them hybrid, we'll come to you. Um, and if you scan the QR code on the postcard, it allows you, um, you know, uh, to engage in however way you want, no pressure, right? But you know, those of you who know me in the room, you know I'm coming for you, right? <laughs> I'm going, you know. Um, um, and so whether you have um, other sources or the data sources that you feel are critical for us to look at, um, because the diversity of the sources of the data um, is also a, a big component of this. Um, whether you have um, community-based organizations or um, sectors of the populations where um, you know, we need to go to them um, you know, to do this work, um, happy to do so. Thank you. One right here in the front. Hi. Um, Introduce Good evening, and thank you very much for that wonderful presentation. My name is Dr. Yvette Martas, and I'm a member of the steering committee for the Latino Endowment Fund. I, my question is more of a philosophical question. Based on the data, and in particular on the brain drain that Connecticut is experiencing, um, which is why white people are leaving, and you say we are re being re your the population is being replaced by Latinos. In Connecticut's attempt to continue to keep the brains in Connecticut, do you see an interest in not just having the working poor staying, but increasing the pipeline for our population to have access to get the brains or develop the brains that we have and keep us here? Wow. That's Amen. Primero, a round of applause for that question. You guys saw me, right? I'm already. <laughs> that is not just a philosophical question, right? Um, I made a statement. This state's economic recovery, growth, innovation, 
Um, where's Charles, the economist? What do we call that, right? Innovation, growth, recovery, all of that economic stuff. I am not an economist. Um, right up to 2050, as, as, as the data projects, is intrinsically tied to the investments, the policies, the opportunities, right, for inclusion um, that this state makes in Latinos and others of color. Point blank. Um, so not so philosophical. Um, and 2050 is not that far off. Um, and so, um, but there, there, there are deep implications. And so um, I'll clarify, um, in part, the Caucasian population is decreasing respectfully because it's aging. They peaked in 2013. This is a very old state, um, not in history, um, but in age for that particular population. Um, but despite uh, the replacement of that population loss, whether it be by Latinos or any other group, because you know, past 2050 it may be someone else, another group, um, we are not investing, we're not including, we are not developing that human capital that is so very young and driving the demographic shift in the state to ensure that we create the pathways for college and career readiness, uh, workforce development, business development. And so that's a conundrum, right? But everything, cada yo digo en español, cada problema tiene una solución, right? If we wanted to find a solution for every problem, we could. And so let's talk about inclusive public policy, right? Economic uh, in, uh, inclusive policies um, that would then yield the return on the investment that you speak to. Okay. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> All right, I think we have time for one more question. Thank you. <laughs> and I'm dealing with the same headaches that you're dealing with, but focusing on Puerto Ricans. So let me give you one suggestion and one question. Yeah. In terms of, part of the problem with census data is it's aggregated, as you well pointed out. Find a geographer, because with ArcGIS you can get level block data, block level data uh, uh, and map it. Uh, and then Yale has a federal uh, state data center that will charge you $20,000, <laughs> but will give you that access to that data. They might not let you publish it for public consumption, because there's something going on there. Uh, but, but my question is a little bit different uh, on those lines. Uh, and I'm happy to send you some resources later on that. Uh, I think you're onto something with the wage earning situation. Because I, I think data measures employment data, and you can't really tell salaries uh, at the end of the year. Uh, one suggestion I have, in addition to looking at, at migration, look at employment data. Because what we're finding in Connecticut, or at least for the past 15 years, is that the elderly population is, has a fixed income. Mm -hmm. They're consuming a lot more resources, Medicare and so on and so forth, and they're not contributing as much to the economy. And this is not a criticism because I'm the first one to the <laughs> retirees. Uh, but the, then you have the Latino labor that is spending everything that they're making because they can't afford to. So, you, so the, I, in, in addition to looking at migration, I would also look at spending power and how much that spending power is contributing to replacing the aging population in Connecticut, because Connecticut is one of the top five states with the elder, uh, eldest population. Yeah. Does, does that make sense? Yes. Uh, I mean, I love but, Charles. But I love when Charles <laughs> is in every single room. No, 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 no. <laughs> and I agree. Um, and I would add one more layer, uh -huh. one more complexity to, the, to not just spending power, but then who holds power. Absolutely. And so while the Caucasian population, right, peaked, declining, on a fixed income, they're also the ones on local boards, they're also the ones making the decisions um, in elected and or appointed seats as to what school budgets should look like or not, and for whom. Exactly. Um, and so, um, thank you, uh, yes, and then like, you know, as soon as I can get off this table, I'm gonna make like a beeline over there and then there's like a whole other bunch of layers, right, that we can add to that because civic engagement is also at the center um, of equity um, and creating opportunity uh, and who holds power and how that power is wielded and yielded. Um, and there's data, there's school budgets, there's voting records, there's, so yeah, there's a, it's a, it, there's a lot of layers Geography, spending, earning, voting, yeah. And, and
And I can't help because, uh, as I mentioned with the digital divide slide, that's been top of mind for me. Um, as much as we want to, you know, paint the picture, um, share, share the realities, which in some cases, you know, are startling, or we already knew, we already feel it, uh, uh, had heard these numbers before, um, but, you know, we want to present it as an opportunity, right? Um, there, there's so much potential within all of our communities, but especially in the Latino community. Uh, but also want to just share, you know, some alarming things too, right? When it comes to thinking about these workforce opportunities or the fact that our community is in, you know, the lower earning uh, positions, but the, you know, the, the fact of what's coming in the future, right? With, with, with regards to automation, with what fields are growing and, and you know, industries are growing within the state and, and we're, if we're not preparing folks for those opportunities, where's that gonna leave folks as well? So again, I think the, 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 the point is also to, to, to hone in the fact that this is the time to again, address where those opportunities to, to invest are in, um, where our support is most needed, and like you said, how can we build that power to address, you know, those in issues that are coming in the future? Well, thank you. I know that was a quick Q&A, um, but we have some amazing panelists here. I'm gonna give it over back to Rosita so she can introduce our panelists. As you're introduced, please come up to the stage. Thank you. Okay, guys, so I wanna introduce our fabulous panelists um, and hear from them. And we have charged them with one question and one question only because we knew that with giving them only 10 minutes apiece, um, they were going to fill up that time very easily with this question. And we asked them, we, we gave them in advance the data that you just saw, and then we also gave them plus more. Uh, but given the data that was just presented, tell us about some best practices or solutions in your particular field that are currently working to overcome these gaps, and what is it that you think is needed for the future? So that's the question. And we invited three fabulous people. We'll start off with Francis Padilla. Francis, please join us on stage. And Francis is the president of Universal Healthcare Foundation of Connecticut and a fellow Wesleyan person. Wesleyan University, yay, in the house. Okay, uh, and since joining Universal in 2004, Francis held various leadership positions and was named to the leadership role of president in 2012. Among her contributions over the years, Francis has spearheaded Universal's research and policy initiatives leading to the design and campaign for the landmark Sustinet Health Reform Plan in 2009 and again in 2011. She masterminded the development of the Connecticut Healthcare Affordability Index a first in the nation's policy analyst tool for assessing how public policies can best address healthcare affordability needs of consumers. And most recently, Francis is leading Universal and other organizations and funders in strengthening the capacity and infrastructure of community organizing for social and health justice in Connecticut over the next five years. Everyone welcome Francis. And I'd also like to welcome and ask Dr. Carlos Liard Muriente to come on stage. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Dr. Liard Muriente is currently a professor of economics at Central Connecticut State University in New Britain. His teaching and research interests include economic theory, entrepreneurship, and economic development of Latin American and Caribbean economies. His published research topics include employment, migration, education, and productivity as it relates to Puerto Rico. He has also published research regarding the impact of the Great Recession on Latinos, and his current research relates to post-COVID business expectations among small and medium-sized businesses in Latin America, with particular attention to women-owned businesses. Everyone, please welcome Dr. Liard Muriente. And last, but certainly not least, a woman who no one here needs an introduction to because everybody knows her, Dr. Leslie Torres Rodriguez, please join us. <laughs> Dr. Leslie Torres Rodriguez is the superintendent of Harvard, Hartford Public Schools, one of the largest urban school districts in Connecticut. She's a product of Hartford Public High School 
and she has served as an educational leader in the greater Hartford region for over 25 years. Prior to her appointment as superintendent, Dr. Torres Rodriguez was acting superintendent and the assistant superintendent for instructional leadership at Hartford Public Schools, where she provided culturally courageous leadership to support the comprehensive improvement efforts of a network of 11 schools. She served as an assistant principal and principal in magnet and neighborhood schools. And most recently, she was recognized by the Association of Latino Administrators and Superintendents. So thank you very much, and let's welcome her to you. So let me reiterate the question that we posed for our panelists today, and then I'm gonna to turn to them one by one. I'd like to start with Leslie first, if that's okay. Uh, and the question that we gave them was, given the data that was just presented, Tell us about some best practices or solutions in your field that are currently working to overcome these gaps and what you need for the future. Good evening, everyone. Buenas tardes. Um, first, I want to just contextualize uh, some of the data to our, our local context here. And specifically in Hartford and in Hartford Public Schools, 57% of our students identify as Hispanic or Latino. And so for us, uh, we're looking at about 9,700 students and 21% uh, of those students are English learners or multilingual learners. And so we know that when we look at the data around the enrollment, right, enrollment is declining, but in terms of the need, in terms of our students, right, there's an increase there. And so that is creating what we call a concentration of need. And so as I think about the data and moving forward and the fact that we're just now thinking about how do we recover from a pandemic, one of the things that we're really focusing on is making sure that we uh, extend learning opportunities. And for us, what that looks like is um, before school, after school programming, summer programming. And research shows that um, in a very powerful way to accelerate and close learning gaps is by offering uh, tutorial support. And by tutorial, I mean high dosage, high frequency tutorial by expert professors or, or teachers, people that really know the content. The challenge there is that that is very expensive. Yeah. So as we think about moving forward and next steps, we have to consider the policy implications and the resource equity uh, in order to meet the needs of, of, of our students. Something else that um, we're working on is meeting the need of what we call the whole student. We know that in the business of education, we have to address the academic needs, absolutely. However, we have to tend to all the other parts of our, of our young people, right? Their social, behavioral, wellness, and support, the way they're developing throughout their uh, school journey. And so uh, some of the examples in which we do that is by uh, establishing success, what we call student success centers. We have uh, primarily our Hispanic and Latino students that uh, you know, early on were not meeting grade level expectations, no fault of their own but they weren't provided the necessary resources or they were just coming um, trying to learn a new language and it, it does take time. And so we had to create student success centers across our high schools to catch our students up. We are proud to say that 20%, there's been a 20% increase in our graduation rate for our multilingual learners. Um, yay. <laughs> Something else that I think about in terms of the, the enrollment implication uh, because though enrollment is declining, right, the need is increasing, and the majority of our staff are not representative of our students' culture, demographic, and so there has to be a strategy to not only uh, cultivate a pipeline of educators, a diverse educators, culturally, linguistically diverse educators, so that our young people feel an extra level of connection, and so they're also able to not just accelerate their learning, but see themselves in the people that are in front of them, in their community, right? We're talking about the brain drain, and so making sure that we continue to create opportunities for our students to see themselves, feel validated, and that we leverage their assets. An example of that is the creation of our uh, dual language program, which is a, is a neighborhood school and will eventually become a magnet school, but essentially what we're doing is making sure that we're not only celebrating, but celebrating and, and, and creating a, a structure and a culture in that school in which multilingualism 
is an asset and the strategy to accelerate learning for our students. Those are some of the examples. Thank you so much, Dr. Torres. Um, so before we turn to you guys and, and ask questions, and I'm, I'm, you, if you see me a little antsy, it's because I'm dying to ask questions. But I want to turn from the first to Dr. Liard Muriente and ask him to respond to the question. First, uh, thank you for the invite. This is a wonderful opportunity. Uh, as you go to the presentation, and I have to emphasize this preliminary, and, and uh, you're starting, and the road ahead will be bumpy, but it will be fascinating. I think I could, you, you could start seeing what, what you're going to hit. And I, the audience might, may or may not remember Walter Mercado. Remember Walter Mercado? <laughs> so I'm going to. Crystal ball. Yeah, I'm going to predict. I'm just going to. Amor y mucha, mucha, mucha paz. So you could predict, you could see that Latinos are going to be a driving force in terms of consumption, but not income. Mm -hmm. Not income in terms of generating income, think in terms of tax revenue for the state. We're not going to have that many Latinos and Latinas being hedge, hedge fund managers yet. We will, just not yet. We're going to be the driving force for yes, mm -hmm. yes, 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 we, yes, yes. We're going to be the driving force for consumption, and consumption is what drives the economy. Mm -hmm. So there, there are so many opportunities there in terms of okay, now we command. We, we're doing it already. It's just that there should be some switching. Most of the income goes to basic necessities, especially housing. Uh, the USA Today always makes this ranking of the worst states to live if you're a Latino. And unfortunately, Connecticut is always on the top of the list for three things, housing, healthcare, and inequality. So we, we need to be strategic in the sense that, yes, a lot of the things that we need to do will be expensive. But you know what? It's also true that Connecticut is a really rich state. There's a lot of wealth here. So hey, if you help out, we help each other, and, and we move up. So that's where you could see us going. So that's the Walter Mer Mer Mercado sort of like, this is where we go. If keeping with that analogy, some of you might be familiar with Jesse Joy. Si mañana es too late, que estamos haciendo ahora? What que estamos haciendo ahora? We, we need to move. We need to be uh, more involved in, as you were talking about, those, those organizations, the schools, what are happening, how this works with us. And in terms of higher education, which is where I'm more involved, uh, we need to have a better communication. We turn to work in silos, you know, we're higher ed, this is K to 12, and the communication tends to be, for many reasons, top to bottom. This is what we could offer to you, and K to 12 is like, all right, your work ends here, and now we take over. That needs to end. It needs to be, okay, what are we bringing, and what, not so much from the top higher ed, this is what we could do, the conversation needs to end in terms of the community involvement, what do we need? And yes, we need more teachers, we need more social workers, we need more hedge fund managers, we need a lot of more. The problem there is that as the Latino population increases, what we need is access, and that access allows you mobility. And the biggest barrier for that access and mobility is that the cost of higher education is going through the roof. So unless we address that, that mobility, that tomorrow, that Walter Mercado scenario, it's going to be difficult. 80% of the students that attend the Connecticut state system stay in the state. That's, that's our source of consumption. That's our source of income. But if we put a big, if you don't have this much, you cannot get in we're gonna be left behind. So unless we address that issue of access, which is the cost of higher education, that movement into a better tomorrow is gonna to be slow and bumpy. So those are my two cents. Thank you so much, Dr. Mugendo. And certainly last but not least, we wanna hear from Francis Padilla. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody. It's really wonderful to see everyone here and in person. I'm so excited oh, yes. about that. Okay, can you hear me? So, healthcare. Uh, Carlos mentioned healthcare is one of those top tier issues that people are concerned about. There's a study that we're getting ready to um, release in collaboration with the Alterum Institute that uh, surveyed uh, 1,300 households in Connecticut. We oversampled for uh, Latino households and black households. And the top three issues are taxes, jobs, economic development, and healthcare. 
And the health care is really of greatest concern to Latinos and blacks because of the affordability burden. It is just simply too expensive. And people are making very, very dire choices. They're not filling prescriptions. They are not going for, um, for uh, procedures or for treatments. They are making rational decisions. There's a lady that we know about who went for a year taking aspirin for a pain inside underneath her ribs. And by the time she was able to get a diagnosis, by the way, she had to do a, a, like a fundraiser to be able to get the money for the diagnosis. She had raised the money and then she found out she had kidney cancer. And that kidney cancer you know, was resolved with charity care from St. Francis Hospital in Hartford. But uh, what happens if she has a, um, you know, another, another bout? And, uh, and so these are the stories in our community and actually in Connecticut households even beyond our community. This is a, a, a crisis. And in order to have be able to be educated, be able to have economic mobility, be able to have wage progression, people need their health. Mm -hmm. We have to think about health as a human right and health care as a public utility. I think of it as a public utility like water and electricity. It needs to be regulated because the industries that dominate health care, hospitals, pharmaceuticals, and insurance companies are not driven by the human right. They're driven by market expectations, right? And so we need policymakers that are willing to stand up to the power of those industries because the kinds of changes that are needed for affordability and access have to actually be fought for very hard politically. And the, the power of the very people that are, in fact, affected, all of us, Latinos, black people, Asian people, poor people, middle income people, our power has to be harnessed to demand the kinds of regulations and policy initiatives that are needed in order to act, get access to affordable, quality, equitable care. There's high mistrust in the health system among Latinos. Uh, this survey that is coming out soon also found high mistrust and distrust, lack of respect in the healthcare system for people based on race and linguistic, uh, you know, and language. And so one of the things that's happening in Connecticut that I'm really excited about, and I was so delighted to see our friends here um, uh, and the, there is a campaign called Husky for Immigrants that's being led by a coalition of organizations, one of which is Connecticut Students for a Dream, which is just an amazing group of young people fighting for justice. And health justice is part of it. So expanding um, Husky coverage to all immigrants in Connecticut, regardless of status, um, it would cost the state 3% of what we spend now and the whole Medicaid program, just 3%. We're talking about, about 30,000 people. It's not even that many people. You asked about the undocumented. How many people go without care? They're injured on the job, and they end up just going home and putting remedios casero on whatever injury they have, or you know, letting a bone heal while it's broken, and not go, it goes untreated. These are things that are happening. You see it in the schools. I'm sure you see it in the schools, and you probably see it in the colleges too, right? So the coalition, Husky for Immigrants, has been fighting to get coverage expanded. And we have been able, we've succeeded. Um, Ilda and, and Edwin are, would be able to attest to it. Last year, was, we've succeeded in what I call small victories, right? Last, two, two years ago, Ex coverage was expanded for children from zero to eight. And then women uh, in pregnancy for up to two years. So that's kind of fragmented. We do everything in healthcare in a fragmented way. But these folks and their friends and families showed up at the legislature 
200 strong. They gave their stories. I didn't know they were going to be here, so this is just beautiful <laughs> for me. But they gave their stories they, 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 in Spanish, and they were translated to legislators. The room was packed with people. So this year, the, the uh, program was expanded to from, from uh, 9 to 12, and then all the kids that are already in can stay until they're 19. Al paso que vamos, it'll be 10 years before we have all immigrants, right? But we're gaining momentum. We're gaining momentum. And there's a household survey that we collaborated with the coalition on to um, really show the legislature that the Connecticut public is ahead of them in so many ways. The Connecticut public, by, by independent of party, wants to see two things affordable health care, control the cost of health care. That's about the prices. That's not about people using their health care. That is about the prices that the industries are driving, right? They want to see that, and they want to see all children covered. It's always easier politically to get mm. kids covered. That's how people think. We want to see all folks covered, because children live in families. They live with adults. Right? We have to say, my call to action for everybody here is we have to say to all our policymakers, and including decision makers in the health systems, the, the health systems are out of control, and that's the topic of an entirely different program. I'll come back for that if you invite <laughs> me. But the, um, we, have to, we have to say, our people, all of us, that are members of the Latino Endowment Fund, all of us that serve on boards, all of us that lead organizations, all of us that work in businesses, own businesses, have to say to the decision makers, healthcare is a human right, and healthcare costs and access must be guaranteed. And we expect you to do that. It will not bankrupt the state. It will make it possible to invest in education. Mm -hmm. It will make it possible to invest in good housing. And it will make it possible to invest in economic development. Thank you. That's my answer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just want to reiterate, and there, there's a couple of things that have been said, so many things that have been said tonight uh, by our panelists. but. Uh, one starting with Ingrid and, and Diana's call about the civic action, you know, civic activity and civic involvement and involvement period. We have so many uh, in our community today who, do, who are educated, who do have a good income, a good salary, a good profession, and we don't get involved. We don't get involved. We don't show up uh, to the Board of Ed. We don't show up to the legislature. Uh, we don't want to spend time on boards because, ah, uh, you know, too much, right? And I totally understand that, having raised two girls myself, it was, you know, not the easiest thing, uh, leaving them and, and going uh, to any of those meetings. Having said that, though, without our presence, you know, no one's going to pay attention to the Latino community needs. We've got to be there, we've got to say presente, and we've got to tell them what the needs are. So thank you very much. At this time, I'd love to turn it over back to our audience. And you have three fabulous presenters here, all of which, all of whom have said so much today and given us so much food for thought. What are your questions for them? Barbara? So um, I think my question might be for uh, Carlos. Um, but I'm not sure. You know, one of the things that uh, struck me um, is that the per hour um, the uh, wage is so low, and I think that part of it is because so many Latinos work in um, jobs that are shift work. So they um, and so they they work in shifts that are not guaranteed. They're they're, they're employed full-time in quotes, but they're not really full-time because their shift change sometimes without, you know, previous knowledge. And so they're always going back and forth between, you know, this job and, that, and this shift. And how much of that do you think is driving that low wage? 
Yes, that's part of it. At the same time, we, we, as the report was pointing out, we also have to look at uh, how many of, of us are coming out of high school, how many of us are not finishing high school, how many of us are going to college or not finishing college. And what, when I have the discussion with my Latino students, the distractions that we might have. Mm -hmm. So uh, how, how many of us are covering because now dad is not able to do it, so I have mm -hmm. to do this and that. So. There are many factors in terms of level of education, opportunities available, given the distractions that I have because I have to not only to contribute to myself pushing forward, but I also have to contribute to the family, the element of the family in the Latino community. But by far, yeah, that's, that's one of the things. And how do we change the dynamic, again, of access? How do we, and, and it, it doesn't start in college. I think the misconception is, oh, once you go to college, no, that, that starts at the pre-K, I will say. Once, because once you're there, the road begins and the distractions, again, that might lead to you, well, we, we have to move, not only because of their ship, because there might be another opportunity somewhere else in another town, in another city, and then I have to come back and I have to go to whatever is available. That, and, and what you said, yes. Francis, you wanna? You know, I'm, I think it's also a structural economic development mm -hmm. problem and the way that the state thinks about job creation we have, uh, you know, in the last 40 years, we, we, Connecticut was a heavy manufacturing state for a long time. Then in the 80s, it lost tens of thousands of jobs that didn't get replaced. But manufacturing isn't dead. Manufacturing is quite alive and thriving, except that you need the digital skills that Diana was talking mm -hmm. about to be able to get like, you know, $30 an hour, $40 an hour jobs, right? And then the other part of it is that our economic development is so uneven. It, it depends on where you live in the state, you know, you, and, and, and the local economic development efforts are sometimes, we just have created a lot of service business in this state that is low wage work. It's low wage work and who gets to, to, to do that work but our people. And so it's a combination. I've always thought about it this way. I served on a couple of commissions and task forces, whatever, over time. But like, why don't people think about what's, what kind of jobs are being created when we are drawing in economic activity? Like, why doesn't the state and the municipalities, why don't they make sure that there are jobs being uh, developed not just because you want the people hired, but that you want quality employment. And quality employment means also having benefits, mm -hmm. yes. good benefits. Amen. Because the wealth gap is huge, and the benefits for health care you know, are so inconsistent. Yeah. So you can have coverage, but you, your deductible is so high, you can't afford to use it. And, and if I quickly, that transformation, oh, sorry, that transformation process was not only unique to Connecticut. If you look to the different manufacturers and clubs, and you could just go to the highway and look at different cities, there was a time where when you go to high school, the opportunity to educate yourself in the trades was there. And, and those are good paying jobs, and, yeah. but that was removed. And then we went in down in the agenda of, can't oh, we can't hear. Can you hear me? <laughs> so we went down the agenda also once we go open as an international trade, not only we cut the opportunities of educating myself in a trade related area, we move many of those jobs away without the consequences of, okay, what's gonna happen to those left behind? So we, we are uncomfortable. What we need to do, without being aggressive, what we need to do is to make those that are in the position to make decisions uncomfortable as well. How mm -hmm. could you work for us now because this is not working? So that requires coordination uh, and mobilization. Community organizing. <laughs> Absolutely. Werner? Yes. Yeah, stand up, please. So, yeah. so, oh, she's, she's coming. coming. Because we're dating, yes. Uh, Dr. Torres, thank you so much for your, uh, your presentation. Um, when, you think, when I think of the tutoring that you're providing at schools, I think that's great because we need to provide that extra support. 
Uh, have you had any experience with um, community schools with wraparound services? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because I think that that could be very helpful. And, and also the question would be about um, enrollment. Are you, you mentioned the enrollment is, is potentially going down. Is that a problem long term? What's your perspective? Yes, so, uh, so glad you talked about community schools. That actually has been part of our strategy um, early on. Um, we actually had uh, work before I got here. There were seven community schools. And you know, fast forward to today, there are 13 community schools. What we did do was expand the framework because we heard from our community when we did deep engagement that there were some inequities. And that need existed across all of our schools. Uh, and so what we did was expand the framework to allow all schools to engage with partners, whether it's every, all of our 39 schools in Harvard Public Schools have a partnership with one or multiple higher ed partners, community-based organizations. And there are some that have a higher concentration of need, and so our community partners come in, and they're with us from the beginning of the school day to evening, with our students and our families providing anywhere from not just a tutorial, after school enrichment, but oftentimes, and now more than ever, given COVID, uh, supports for students and families around mental health and clinical supports. So yes, I don't think we could move forward and accelerate and recover without wraparound supports for students, and in our case, many of our families. With regard to the enrollment, it is actually, we've done the enrollment uh, trends and the studies, and across the state, I believe there's less than a handful of school districts that are seeing enrollment increasing, in, increase. The rest are seeing enrollment declines, and that is also what we saw, the, the data points that Ingrid uh, shared, right, across the state. The challenge there is that while the numbers are going down, the, the need is increasing. So people think, easy to think, right? You think, well, less students, that means you need, you need less resources. No, because the need is higher and it's more concentrated. And so the perception is inaccurate, and so that's, that's something moving forward that we have to continue to educate ourselves and our community and our policymakers that just because the enrollment is down does not mean that our funding has to go down as well because the level of need is increasing. And so how do you support students? Right, there's a resource equity issue that we have to also tackle. True. True, and, and so we tried in Hartford Public Schools, and we did, we created with our families and our community an equity-centered budget, but that's gonna take us but so far, right? We're good now, I will say, and I'll probably will never say this again, we're good now because we have relief funding. Right. We have federal relief funding. Right. That's right. right, so 2024, I don't have a strategy. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure it out. So community schools, I will not be able to sustain 13 community schools. I will not, past 2024 as an example. Yep. Okay. Sure. Uh, thank you, Dr. Leslie. Th this is Janitzi from Hispanic Federation. Um, while well, you say, right, that the enrollment has been declining, um, we also know, as you mentioned, that the needs are increasing. But most importantly, in the Hartford area, we have seen that diversity has been growing on unexpected towns. Um, so with that said, what is the plan to really include those type of after-school programs, wraparound services outside of the Hartford City and nearby city? Yeah, so I actually, um, I'm hearing from some of my colleagues, superintendents, uh, we also have an ecosystem of school choice, right? And so we operate magnet schools, others operate magnet schools, our students access programming in our surrounding towns. And that is something that I hear from our partners in, others, in other cities that they do want and they need to have access to those, to those services. Um, it, I think it takes the coordination. You know, when, when a question, when you ask the question around what, what are next steps, at the macro level, I think we need a lot of work to coordinate efforts, yes, locally, macro, but beyond Hartford. Because one, not only are our students moving around, but there's a lot of transiency yeah. among our families. It's really hard sometimes for us to keep track of where our families are, and the needs don't stop, right? The needs follow, and so that's, that's a level of, of next step for us to figure out. Because when I look at the equity indicators, they don't work in isolation, right? right? I'm looking at housing burdens. I'm looking at you know, education attainment. Uh, language access, all of those are interconnected. And so if we're thinking of our response in a siloed response, 
We're gonna get, we might get some improvement and close some of the barriers, but I think we're gonna get faster if we coordinate at the macro larger level. Exactly. I, yes, Dr. Martins. <laughs> It helps if you hold on to the microphone. I know, right? <laughs> I'm not giving it up. <laughs> um, once again, thank you. I am very excited. My heart is like going very fast because I'm hearing all these incredible speakers and I'm filled with a room of people who are incredibly dedicated to make a change in our society. But I pose you all a challenge. Healthcare, and I'm gonna tie it in. Healthcare for me is a very personal issue. I'm an obstetrician gynecologist now for 30 years. and. I'm thinking about retiring, and I'm thinking, but if I retire, I don't see anybody that looks like me that's gonna take care of my patients. And I'm gonna tell you, um, one of the reasons that I think we have such a paucity of professionals that look like us in our community is because first of all, we are still very, very young in this acquisition of money and power. Yeah. And we tend to argue amongst ourselves we don't unite with the African-American community. We, we, we struggle with who we are as a people because America makes us want to identify ourselves as individuals, number and one. White. And white. Number two, for those of us who do get to progress through these institutions, we are told that we are the exceptions to the rule. Yes. Exceptions and so as a result, we don't, we struggle we struggle on our own with all of the factors that you have mentioned about helping our families. But then we continue to struggle and we forget how we got to our positions. We forget about what it actually takes to make the process. It's not necessarily knowing another doctor or knowing another lawyer. It's your abuela, your mother, your father, your sister, your aunt who got up at three o'clock in the morning to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. That is the persistence that's gonna get us through our success mm -hmm. of Walter Mercado. <laughs> but I pose to you that we have an obligation to not only provide access to healthcare, but to provide quality healthcare. I can't tell you the number of patients that I do a lot of interpretation of facts for that I tell them, this is what they did to you, this is why they took out your uterus, and they have no clue. This is such an unjust process that it infuriates me. And so I suggest that we put our heads together and create a pipeline. We need to create clinicians that look like us because this story of us having to share our family's uh, problems and we can't succeed, man, that, is so old, mm -hmm. okay? So I say, I propose that we have what it takes to, I understand that our short-term problems are very, very real, but they're the same in old ones. And the only ones that we, the only way that I can see our way out is for us to create the pipeline that's gonna make the clinicians, make the lawyers, and I'm not saying everybody has to be a doctor, but we need to understand how to navigate the system. And the only way to do it is if we have honest people that look like us, that will speak the language, that can understand when we say, tengo un soplo por aquí, you know, that that's what's gonna make the difference. And so I am more than happy to put my head and years of experience together with anyone else on the panel or anyone else here who is interested in that program. Thank, Thank you, you, doctor. Thank you. Question, yes. Young lady, stand up. Oh, yep, you. She looks at me, young lady. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Kelly. I'm a PA, so also a clinician. Ah. I just wanted to <laughs> build on what the doctor said. Um, I think it's really important to have workforce that looks like the patients that we serve in. I've worked in community clinics, and I can see, you know, I can say, um, you know, one community clinic in Hartford. It serves about 80% people that are Hispanic, and how many clinicians are Hispanic? Or, you know, how many can speak the language? Mm -hmm. And it's not the same when you're just using, you know, the translator line. So, definitely agree with that. Um, and the health system, it just doesn't really work, like the, like the 15 minute appointments. That, as a clinician, mm -hmm. 15 minutes, 
to really talk to our patients and to really go over years and years and decades of like no health literacy, it just doesn't work. And we need to get involved, we need to put the pressure in the organizations that fund those community clinics, like HRSA, to make changes to how we serve those communities. Thank you. Somebody else, did I see a hand up here? Yes, Hilda? Oh, I'm sorry, who? Right here, right here. Rosa, a young I thank you very much uh, for your presentation concerning the, uh, you know, the whole thing about finding a job, educating yourself, you know, and, and moving forward. I'm going to tell you I have a prejudice because I'm an employment lawyer, and <clears throat> I've seen a lot of great people, well qualified, well intended and uh, people that are great uh, get stuck because of employment discrimination and many other barriers. And I wonder how did you factor that in in the uh, whole issue of mobility because I've seen well-qualified people working under the assumption that first you got your education as a gift and you know you were not really qualified for this job but because affirmative action you're here. And, and how, do you, how do you fight after you become qualified and you have all your experience on the table, how do you deal on a day-to-day -day basis with uh, gender discrimination, with you know, harassment, with ethnic uh, oppression, and with all of those things? We, I think we need to look beyond the preparation. We need to look about what people come to and the environment that they face once they get a job. Because a lot of people leave well-paying jobs simply because they're not accepted, they're marginalized, and, and you know, if you look at the statistics, the Commission on Human Rights and the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission have tons of complaints from people, not only undocumented, but people that are immigrants, but people that were you know, born and raised here that are of Hispanic heritage, that are marginalized and treated like second-class citizens. And so my point is, how do we we, we need to put that as part of the initiative of moving forward is how do we deal with the workplace, the terms and conditions of employment that make people feel less than and really make it, uh, you know, what will otherwise be a very productive job uh, like hell. Uh, because, you know, that, that is the reality of today. Doctor, I think, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I believe it's, it was directed to Dr. Liard right. Murian, no, Murian my best here. Uh, I, I think probably everybody in this room have experienced some sort of discrimination, and when that happens, it's, it's one of those that you go, "Oh, this is what they mean by that." When when it hits you, in, in, in all places, uh, whether it's at work or at the store, uh, I think I, I mentioned the the notion of getting people uncomfortable. One of the things that I've, I've been trying to push is as we transition and we become more powerful, there, there's going to be that period of transition where we, we will not be there. I think for certain uh, professions, whether it's banking, whether it's social work, whether it's uh, nursing, there, there needs to be a way where we put people into places where they're more culturally aware. So if, if for example, a, a, a simple example will be, if you are going to be a social worker or a nurse or you are a business student and you're going to banking or you're creating uh, uh, your own business, if you're going to do a one-year language, it should not be Spanish 101, Spanish 102, for example, where you do the conjugation and Maria tiene zapato, Maria tenía zapato, Maria. Nobody cares if Maria about the shoes. And probably it's going to be zapatos. We're not going to Spain, so we don't say zapatos. <laughs> What we need to do is like, look, here's a population. Here's how the language in the population works, and this is how the culture operates. So you need to have a cultural awareness Spanish sort of a class that is a year sequence that will prevent situations. You know, when, when we go to, you don't, you don't say this, or you don't say that, or doing this is wrong. And no, we look at the type of work that they're doing, look at the distractions that I'm, uh, I'm mentioning. Uh, so that's one. The other thing is, I think we need to start to prepare the future generation to, to be wonderful teachers and wonderful physicians and wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, whatever they want to be, but also to be wonderful owners. Mm -hmm. there, there's, an, 
there's a need for ownership because once you become an owner and then you're not the one working but you're the one hiring you understand better that reality i was there i understand coming here and and if we have more people like us hiring we win that's it so that mentality of, of changing i want to be this i want to be an owner and and if, if we start doing by the way that at, at higher ed it's too late it, you had to start that in, in k-12 and the disadvantage of that as you know Doro was mentioning is the limitations that you have because they're going to point at enrollment going down so you need less funds uh you don't have the flexibility that we might have in higher ed of saying well we could increase tuition by three percent and we're going to increase food by two percent and we're going to increase room and more by two percent you we do that you don't have that flexibility so the focus needs to start at k-12 if we start yes we need to lower the cost of higher education but we need to realize that that mentality where are we going how do we change attitudes it starts at k-12 i would also say that i would also say because this is my my area diversity equity and inclusion and i was just giving a speech today um, for the um, employee resource group at the hartford and i they asked a very similar question in terms of you know what should latinos be doing in terms of diversity equity and inclusion and the first thing out of my mouth because honest to god i see very few of us engaged in this is to get involved in their own company's diversity equity uh, and inclusion initiatives um, there, there are, when it comes to having these in-depth discussions, these difficult conversations with the powers that be in those companies, many of us become shy. Ay bendito, you know, I know, I feel a little bit, you know, afraid, I don't want to step up and don't want to talk. That's an issue. That's an issue because if we're not at the table and we're not talking about what, what our needs are and what we're experiencing, along with the other communities that are at the table, then we're never going to be heard, listened to, or any of the things that could benefit us be acted on. And there was somebody over there. Thank you. Buenas noches. Voy a decirlo en español para que ¿Sí? mis compañeras puedan entenderlo. Claro. Esto lo acabo de escribir. No es una pregunta, es como un comentario al tema que estamos tocando. Ah, bueno, en primer lugar, pienso que la educación y la salud es un derecho al que todos deberíamos poder acceder sin importar nuestro país de nacimiento, color o el tipo de trabajo que tengamos. Muchas de nuestras personas latinas llegan a, perdón, llegan a Estados Unidos con muchos sueños que se ven frustrados por diferentes razones, puede ser un estatus migratorio, problemas de salud o las horas de, horas de trabajo. Y es aquí cuando debemos postergar nuestros sueños para después. Siempre he oído historias de personas que me dicen que querían ir a la universidad, pero por el costo alto nunca pudieron, o incluso personas, me incluyo, que dejamos de ir a una cita médica por miedo al recibo, eh, al bill médico que puede llegar. No todas las personas tenemos las mismas oportunidades en este país. Y siempre le pregunto a mi esposo y le pregunto a los que están acá, um, ¿Dónde van los taxes de todas las personas que no reclaman sus taxes? Uh -huh. Porque los pagamos, ¿eh? Ajá. Sí, ¿por qué no tenemos salud gratis para todos y educación? No pedimos más que estos. Estos son derechos básicos que todos necesitamos. Los latinos inmigrantes contribuimos mucho dinero a este país, pero a cambio no obtenemos mucho. Y quisiéramos poder soñar con ir a la universidad y terminar y también ir al médico sin miedo al costo económico y queremos tener derechos en este país como todos. Gracias. Gracias. Woo. Yes, yes, yes. One more question and I had recognized, yes, Representative Hilda Santiago, yes. No, I don't have. Thank you. Well, I think I, I really enjoyed um, what was said here today. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Representative Hilda Santiago and I represent the, the great city of Meriden, but I'm always in Hartford, right? Thank you, Magali. Um, and I'm in some other towns um, frequently. And I come to these events because I like to see what's being presented, right? And there's a lot of need out there, and, and, and we lack a lot of those needs as a people, as a Latino group. But can anybody tell me 
How many legislators we have in the Senate and the House in the, in the state of Connecticut? Besides Warner. Uh, and, and, uh, <laughs> Who works and, for you. And Ingrid. <laughs> and Francis. But, and that's a question that, no, no. It, we have 187 legislators. Out of those 187 legislators, two are women, Latinas, that's Minnie and I, and it's been like that for over 10 years, and before that, it was Minnie by herself. We have about 10, 11, 12 Latino men that are legislators from around the state. They're all, we all work well together, and we formed this Black and Puerto Rican caucus. But the reason I'm saying this is because Part of the education for me as a, as a politician, which I'm proud to say, because when I started off as a politician, I wasn't proud of that name, but I am now because of the work that I've done in, in my state and in my community. But you need to also inform the, the, the crowd that you have of what politicians, what Latino politicians are involved in the state because I think that motivates you more to get involved. Mm -hmm. Because if, like Ingrid said, if you're not involved in the school board, you don't know how much they're spending in your children's education or your grandchildren. If you're not involved at the local town committee, whether it's Republican or Democrat, you don't know what policies they're thinking about and what they're talking to their elected officials. If you're not involved in city hall, which is the way I started because my son was learning disabled, and I had to be that voice at the table because my son in Meriden was not getting the services he needed. I went to Board of Ed meetings, I went to City Council meetings, and I fought for that. And if it wasn't for me fighting for my son as an advocate, because he was my son, and for other parents that I translated for, he wouldn't have graduated high school. Because the people that were making those decisions at the Board of Ed, at City Hall, didn't look like me. They weren't women. They weren't head of household raising two kids, and they didn't speak Spanish. So we, we need to really get involved when this is being presented as far as healthcare, education, economic development, workforce development, all those issues that we fight for in the legislature because we watch everything that gets put on the floor to make sure that there's equity for everybody. And the first thing we think about is our communities, our poor community, and our Latinos. Because if we're not there at the table, they're passing legislation that don't even affect us because there's no other voices at that table. And you don't have to be an elected official. You can just go and work on a campaign and support someone that has the same values as you do. And that's what's important. Every time I go to a president, and I'm not knocking this presentation down, the information is great, but we should look at also adding policy engagement. It doesn't have to be politics. It doesn't have to be civic engagement because everybody just talks about voting. It's more than just voting. It's about having that voice at the table to make sure that we're all being treated equally. If you want stuff to happen at, community, uh, at the CHRO, we have to make sure that people that are being hired look like us because those are the ones that are going to understand our culture, whichever we come from, because we're not, we're not a monolith community. Right. And, and I, just, I just don't see that, as I ran for Secretary of State, that we still in the state, as many Latinos that we have in this, in this state, we still don't have a constitutional officer that looks like us and speaks Spanish. Right. Right? And right. why is that? And then when, when people complain about it, they're not voting, or they're not engaged, or they're not helping the politician. It's just like, it, it's, it just gets me so aggravated sometimes because I've been doing this for over 30 years, and, and it's still the same story. And we need to change for our young people. Thank you. Because if we don't change for our young people, we're going to be talking about this 50 years from now, and, we're, and I'm not going to be here by then. <laughs> Thank so, you. Thank thanks. you. Thank you so much. Gracias. Uh, Una uh, más. Thank you very much. One more, like she said. Okay. 
Um, I'm not going to repeat what my colleague says here, but I'm going to tell you guys a story uh, that happened a couple of years ago here in Hartford. It was a little girl that came from PR. She was nine years old, and she came to Frog Hollow. She went to Burns School, and then she turned around, she went to college, and she went through the whole nine years because the family didn't have enough resources. Now, today, she is the superintendent of the public, of the Harvard Public yeah. School. Yeah. Now, I would like to add to that, it was not easy for her to get where she said she is right now. It was not easy, it was a fight, she knows that. I think that I spay, spend days and, and, and mornings calling, making phone calls, try to be sure that our next superintendent was a Latina was a Boricua, a product from Hartford. But what happened after that? Okay, we were successful, yes, yeah, she's there. But then what is a problem in the, in the Hartford Public School, our own people go after her, criticize her, don't support her, it's, they are not there for her. No, no, because you know what? As Latino, as Puerto Rican, we very fast uh, to judge people. Very fast, you know, we don't want to hear, we don't want to listen, any, 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 uh, any, we don't want to, no excuses. We just jump and we uh, decide well, whatever. Now, she's, she's up there, she's been doing a great job, great job. But I would like to know, <clears throat> yep. I would like to know how many Latinos, how many Puerto Ricans are behind her, helping her. I would like to see that, because whatever, whenever I go, and it's a problem, it's her name that they mention. Now, it's the same thing that happened with us legislators. <clears throat> we are 11 Latinos. And when somebody introduced a bill at, at the Capitol, that really hurt our community, I would like to know how many Latinos are at the Capitol fighting for that bill, because that bill, if that bill really hurt our community, we have to be there. And we have to let them know, listen, we belong here. We belong here, and we are here, and we are here to stay. We gotta put that fight now, 11 Latinos, state representative, by ourselves. We fought hard, we fight hard. It's every day, every day. Now, we have 151 state representatives, and we are only 11. So imagine us fighting against them when it's a bill that we know that really help our community, and we wanna be there for our community. We have a lot of rep that they don't believe in helping and giving nothing, especially to immigrants. Now, we hear uh, Boricuas, who are United States citizens, and they treat us as a second class citizen. But again, I'm gonna ask the same question. How many people are behind us? How many people call us? How many people go to the, go to the Capitol and say, hey Minnie, can you help us with this bill? Because we don't know everything. If it is a bill that really is not helping the students here, you know, in, in, in here in Hartford, let us know. Please don't criticize us. Just go and say, listen, we need help. Can you help us? I represent Frog Hollow. Frog Hollow, I will say that maybe it's like 70% Boricua. I enjoy my district. I enjoy my district every day because I'm Boricua, mira hasta lo último, right? But I'm also Latino, and I understand that we all have the same problems. Now, thank I you, State Representative. We have to close because it's after hours okay, already. We passed say, our time. I'll, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I will say, listen, we at the Capitol, and we can. You can call us. You can visit us, and we're there for you guys. You guys voted for us, and we're there to support you guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Barbara. I will now turn it over to Barbara, our fearless chair. 
uh, to close out and um, lead us in a call to action, woman. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone, for this wonderful conversation. And uh, first, um, I want to ask all the members of the Latino Endowment Fund Steering Committee to please stand up. These individuals are the team that support uh, this incredible effort. And I'm here to ask all of you who are not members of the Latino Endowment Fund to please join us. Please join us in this fight for our community so that we can have a better impact. And as Aura will say, there's a QR co code right here. Join us. Just join us. Uh, it's easy, uh, it is easy to do. And finally, I want to thank two individuals. It is hard to uh, point out people in a team effort, but there are two people that I really wanna thank. I wanna thank the person who helped put this together, Aura. And please, Aura, <laughs> she made it happen. And I also want to thank the person at the Hartford Foundation who is always there for us, always working for us in doing just an incredible job. Sue, where are you? <laughs> Sue Dana. And finally, on your way out, I wanna tell you that we have Las Reinas están con nosotros, parece, so that you can see Las Reinas. Our beautiful queens are here. Thank you, everyone. And please don't forget to buy the centerpieces uh, to support the wonderful entrepreneurs that we have here. Thank you and good evening. Thank you.